Hey guys, welcome to the video for exponential equations, exponential regression, and geometric sequences. Um, so this video is going to be in four parts. The first part is we're going to learn how to graph exponential equations. The second part is we're going to learn how to write exponential equations. Third part is learning how to use exponential regression. And the fourth part is exponential uh, geometric sequences, I'm sorry. Um, now with this lesson, I'm going to try to have you guys use some practice with Desmos. Um, now Desmos is a little finicky, so it's really important that you guys are typing things in exactly how you want them to be. Um, if you don't, then there's going to be some issues. Um, again, I'll go ahead and kind of go through that in this video. I'm going to try to split screen as much as possible just so that you guys can see um, the totality of everything. Um, but I just want to go ahead and just give you that warning. It is in four parts, though. So this is two days of lessons into one. So it's going to seem like a lot at first. Um, but I think everything individually is pretty simple. And as long as you can break it down and remember those key things, then it should be OK. Um, so our essential question is, what are the key components of an exponential function? So unit eight is all about exponential equations and exponential functions. Um, and that's pretty relevant when we're talking about um, growth of a city or talking about bacteria spreading or viruses spreading, actually. So um, it's actually really prevalent in um, medical studies because it actually shows pretty um, uh, pretty accurately the spread of how things, how fast things spread. Um, it also is used in um, chemistry a lot for talking about carbon dating and the life of certain elements. Okay, so an exponential function. Now we are introduced to this very first time in unit two, which is a very long time ago. And we learned that the parent function there is y equals two to the power of x. So I'll go ahead and show you your three parent functions that we learned. Um, now I'm gonna be using Desmos test mode. So if you do not have the blue test mode, de test mode Desmos, it's really important that you download that. Um, and yours should say your school name on it, but I'm gonna go ahead and choose my assessment to be star and hit start practice. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and show you the parent function for unit two. So in unit two, we learned the linear parent function. That's the one that's a straight line. It's the most basic line we can make. And then we also learned the uh, quadratic parent function, which is x squared. So that's the second parent function we learned. And then the last parent function we learned is the exponential parent function, which is two to the power of x. Now remember to write an exponent in Desmos. Um, you want to hit this a to the b power button. So it's going to be a to the b, and you'll see um, it goes up to the exponent in there, and you just type in an x. So we learned three parent functions in unit um, uh, unit uh, unit two. In unit three, four, five, we spend it with lines. In unit six and seven, we spend quadratics. And in unit eight, we just spend with um, exponentials here. So that's what one kind of looks like. So an exponential function in this equation where x is the exponent. Okay, so instead of x being one of our variables um, at the bottom, it's actually an exponent for us here. Now, an exponential equation has this basic form. The basic form is y equals a times b to the power of x. Now, you do need to know this formula because it is not given to you on a star test. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about what these values represent. So our a value represents our starting or initial amount. So initial, initial slash starting amount. Okay. Also known as our starting value, our starting um, value, initial value, whatever that may be. So it's also known as your starting or whatever you're beginning with. Your B is also known as your growth factor. This is how much your exponential is either growing by or decaying by. So you have two um, instances here. Um, if your B is larger than one, so if it's a number greater than one, it's going to be a growth. Okay, if your b is larger than 1, it's a growth. It's getting larger. And I'll show you that in a little bit in Desmos. If your b value is less than 1, it's going to be a decay. Okay, so it's actually decreasing. Okay, so your, your b is also known as your growth factor. Now, remember, every equation that we want to actually graph and put inputs into has to have an independent and a dependent variable. So as always, we have an x and a y in our equation. It's just that our a and b are there two different ones that we haven't really talked about. So we have a lot of information on this first page, so I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about why A, B has to be greater or less than. So here, notice how your B value here is 2. B here is 2. Your A value technically is 1. So if you do 1 times that, technically your A value here is a 1. We just don't have to write the 1 there. Um, so I'll show you what happens when your A value becomes less than 1. So let's say 1 half. So 1 half to the power of x. Oops. Notice how that's a dk. It's in the opposite direction because that a value is less than 1. Now, can a value be 1? Well, let's try that. We'll do 1 to the power of x. 1 to the power of x. Now, that's a flat line. The reason why b can't be 1 is because anything to the, or 1 to any exponent is going to just give me 1. 
right? Like if I plug in a five, it's going to be one. One to the power of six is one. So no matter what, you can't have b being one because it's not exponential. So b either has to be greater than one or less than one. All right, so here's an example of a growth picture. So here's just an example equation, just a visual example. Um, we're not actually going to be specifically graphing it or anything. But here, notice how your a value is 2. Your a value here is 2, which means your starting value is at 2. And the 3 is your b value. Remember, b value means you is your growth factor. Whoops. Sorry about that. The bell just rang. Um, so your b is your growth factor here. Now, in this case, your b here is larger than 1, which means you actually have a growth because it's larger than one. So if you have a growth, your graphs are always gonna kinda look like this. They're gonna start off low on the left side and then increase like this. And I'm actually going to um, color this in green to show you that it is a growth. Um, and then here, that's just your A value, so that's not super, it is important, but it doesn't mean anything for when we're graphing here. Um, so this is also known as a growth. So it's, the graph increases from left to right. So it's increasing from left to right. So starting on the left, it's going to slowly increase up. Okay, here is a decay, where here we have our A value is 4, which means that's our starting value, our starting amount. That's really important for later on when we're talking about word problems. So just keep that in mind that A means starting amount. Um, but your B here is a one-third. So your B here is one-third, but that number is less than 1, which means we have a decay. So what does a decay graph look like? So on the left, it's going to start off high, but then as you go to the right, it's going to slowly decrease. Um, so this one's going to decrease from left to right. Decreases from oops, left to right. Okay? Decreases from left to right. I'll go ahead and color code these to kind of match what we have over there. Growth is greater than 1. Decay is less than 1. All right. Okay, moving on to asymptote. Now, this is a brand new vocabulary word for us, and I'm going to go ahead and explain what this means. For, uh, write the definition down and then explain what it means. So our asymptote is a horizontal line It's actually an imaginary horizontal line. Let me go ahead and, oops. An imaginary, it's an imaginary horizontal line that the function never crosses. This is also known like a boundary line. Okay, an imaginary horizontal line that the function never crosses. Um, it's an imaginary, which means you don't actually graph it, but it is technically there because it's never going to touch it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of show you. So for example, let's say I have a, well, let's talk about horizontal first. So remember, a horizontal line means that the line is going to go side to side. Um, so let's say, for example, I have an imaginary line. I'm going to graph it here just to show you that it exists. But I'm going to go ahead and just draw like a dotted line here. This is our imaginary line. Okay, so let's say we have an imaginary horizontal line here, and that's our asymptote. Now, that's a really weird word, but it is super important because that's the main thing about exponential functions, that they all have an asymptote. Um, now, an asymptote is, again, the line that it never gonna, is never going to touch. So if I were to graph something here, it's never going to touch that line. So notice how these graphs, um, this one starts off low and then goes up high. This one goes up high and goes up low. But notice how at the bottom, it goes really, really flat. Now, it goes really, really flat because it's getting close to a line, but it never actually touches. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and draw like a picture example. So let's say this picture, it's going to get really close to it, but it never touches it like that. Um, so that pink line is your asymptote. It never touches. Now, that pink line goes through which axis here? It goes through your y-axis. So it's always going to be written as y equals a number. Okay? So your axis of symmetry when we're doing quadratics is always written as x equals a number. Here, asymptote is always written as y equals a number because it goes through the y-axis. And the reason why you have to write y equals is because it's an equation of a line. A line you need to have, if you want an equation, you have to have an equal sign. So we have an equation of a line here. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you an example of what that looks like. So let's graph our parent function. y equals 2 to the power of x. Um, now, if you don't know how to write an exponent, 
oops, again, it is this a to the b. a to the b will let you push it up to the exponent, so power of x. Um, now notice this graph here is a growth graph because a here is 2. Now if you look, I'm going to go ahead and change the color so it doesn't look the same. So let's make it red. If you look, it looks like it touches the x-axis, doesn't it? But if I zoom in as much as I can, let's keep going. Oops, I didn't mean to click on that. Nope, let's still click that. It's okay. If I zoom in, notice how this x-axis is right here, and it's never actually touching it. So it gets super close. It gets really, really close, but it never actually touches. Also, if you hit this home button here, it'll help you return back to your home and get undistracted. Um, so then, again, that's your asymptote. So in this case, it would be the equation y equals 0, and I'll show you that. y equals 0. Oh, and I'll change the color of that so it's not the same. So that green line is your imaginary line. That green line's not really there. Um, so it's, it's there imaginarily. Imaginarily? Whatever. Use your imagination, I guess. Um, but the green line is not really there, but it's saying that, that that green line, your red line, your red graph, is never going to touch. Because if I zoom in, you see how red and green never actually touch each other. So that's what an asymptote is. It's just an imaginary line that your graph never touches. Okay. Now, domain of an exponential. Domain of an exponential function it's going to be all real numbers. The reason why is because, remember, domain is associated with your x values, and so you can plug in any number for x. Like, you can plug in literally any number for x, any negative, any positive. So if x can be anything, then it's all real numbers. Your range, however, is restricted. Remember, range is associated with your y values. If I'm looking at this graph here, this red graph is never going to touch the bottom half of this graph. So it can't be all real numbers because you don't get every possible y value. So it's restricted. Now, your range is always going to be restricted. And remember, your range is your, associated with your y values. And anytime it's restricted, you're going to use inequality signs. Well, your y values are always going to be greater than a certain number. And that certain number is your asymptote number. So basically, whatever um, this number is, this number is going to be the same thing, okay? So basically, whatever your asymptote number is, your range is going to be the same number. Now here, it's just y is greater than, not y is greater than or equal to, because if you notice here, y is greater than um, x here, um, because, or y is greater than zero here, because this red line is, ne is always greater than zero. It's never equal to zero because it never touches zero, so it can't be equal to it. If it never touches it, it can't be equal. Okay, so let's actually start practicing. Okay, first part was very informational. I was trying to go through it as slowly as possible to try to get through that. All right, number one, we're going to graph this in Desmos. So I'm going to type in three parentheses, one half parentheses to the power of x. You don't have to write the y equals at the front. So I'm going to go ahead and type that in. We have three parentheses. Okay, um, so I'm just using my keyboard down here. It's better if you use a Desmos keyboard and not your, I, your iPad keyboard that you get with it. Um, it's better if you use this because you make less mistakes with this. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but you would make less mistakes. All right, so you're going to type in 1 half. To type in a fraction, you just do 1 divided by 2. I'm going to type in 1, and then my division sign, divided by 2. Once I have that in, notice how your cursor is in the denominator. You want to click out of it so you're outside of it and then close the parentheses. Then you want to go up to the exponent. Remember, the exponent button is here. A to the B, so you can type that and then hit X. And you'll notice you'll have a graph pop up. Now, looking at this graph, I know it's a decay. It's starting off high and then it's slowly decreasing as I go from left to right. So how could I know it's a decay without even graphing it? Well, notice your B value here is less than 1. It's less than 1 here. B here is less than 1. It's a half, which means we have a decay. Okay? Now, graphing it. So using graphs with Desmos, um, you need to create a table, or you need to ask it for a table. So to ask it for a table is different from creating a table. So we're going to learn how to create a table in the very last part of the notes. Um, we're going to learn how to um, make a table from what we have. So given an equation that we type in, I want to get a table from that. I'm going to hit this little settings icon, little gear, and then you'll notice that a table pops up. So I'm going to click on that table and I get this. And you'll see that it already plots some points for us. Now, given the graph that we have, we need to be able to pick some points that we can actually plot. Now, I like for you guys to pick at least three points, three points that you can plot. Um, now, you can't plot negative 212 here because our graph on our notes doesn't fit negative 212. So I'm just going to go ahead, and you know what, I think I'm going to split screen at this point. Oh, gosh, I messed up. I messed that up, didn't I? Yep. Hello? Will you, will you let me? Oh, I don't think it's going to let me. That's so strange. I thought it let me do that. Let's try one more time. Oh, I guess it won't let me split screen, so it is what it is, I guess. All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and pick three points that work for us. Um, so one of the points was negative 1, I think 6. 
negative 1, positive 6, 0, 3, and 1, 1.5. So let's go ahead and graph what we have here. So negative 1, comma 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 3, and then 1, 1.5. Okay, so here is our graph so far. Now, obviously, looking at the graph that I have on Desmos, I know which way this graph is going to go. Obviously, this is a decay, so it starts off high and goes low. The question is, where is our asymptote? We don't want to connect our line or draw the line through our graph until we know what our asymptote is. So here's the uh, trick with an asymptote. It's whatever number is being added or subtracted to the back of your equation. So right, equation, equation. Um, so the back of our equation here, there is no number being added or subtracted. So technically there's a plus zero here. Sometimes you will have an actual number. You'll see that for the next few problems, you're actually going to have an actual number. Um, so here we have plus zero. So that means our asymptote here is going to be at zero. But remember, it's an equation of a line. So that, that equation of line is horizontal, so it's going to go start out with y equals, and it's going to be 0. It's going to be the same number as the number in your equation that's being added or subtracted. Okay, so I'll show you what that would look like. So if I type in y equals 0, so if you type in box 2 in your decimals and type in y equals 0, you'll see that that line, that black line, and that blue graph are never going to touch. So black is your asymptote. That's the line that's going to get really, really close to you but never touch. It's a boundary line. All right, so that means it's never going to touch 0. So I'm going to go ahead and mark 0 on my y-axis, and I say, hey, my graph is never going to touch that part here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my graph. It starts off high. Oops. It starts off high, and then it slowly decreases. But again, it's never going to cross that yellow line at, at 0. So I'm going to get it really close, but it's never going to actually touch. And remember, you need on both ends, you need uh, arrows because it's continuing both ways. All right, the next thing is, x-intercepts. Do we have any x-intercepts? So the goal here is, let's identify what we have. Well, if I click on my x-axis, on my, you guys can't see my finger, but I'm clicking on the x-axis here with my finger. Um, now, are there any x-intercepts? And the answer is no, because it gets really close to your x-axis, but it never actually touches. So it's never going to touch it, then you don't have any x-intercepts. So you have none here. Okay. And then it's asking you for a y-intercept. So with a y-intercept, I can either look on my table or I can just look at my graph. If I look at my graph, I can see that there's some points plotted on here. If you click on the y-axis where it crosses, it will actually show you the point. So the point of our y-intercept is 0, 3. Now remember, domain of an exponential function is going to be always all going to be all real numbers, especially when we're talking about um, just a general graph. If we're not talking about word problems, then it's not going to be all real numbers all the time, but it is in this case. All right, and then your range, your y values are always going to be greater than, remember, not equal to because it's never going to touch. All of your y values are greater than your asymptote number. They're all greater than that number because it never touches that number. In this case, it is zero, so it's the same there. Moving on to number two, let's go ahead and graph this. Now, this gra uh, equation looks a little bit different because there aren't any parentheses here. But remember, your x is always attached to the number with parentheses. So technically, there's a parentheses here, and technically, there's a 1 there. So your a here is 1, and your b here is 2. Now, if b here is 2, that's greater than 1, right? If it's greater than 1, that means it's going to be a growth. Oops. But I can always graph that and see that it's a growth. Remember, a growth increases from left to right. So I'm going to type in 2, two to the power of x minus 4. Now I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this x here, or x it out. All right, so 2 to the exponent of x. And then we want to do minus 4. Now remember, when you type in minus 4, you don't want to be in the exponent. Notice how your cursor here is inside the exponent. So you want to tap outside of it and type in minus 4. And your graph will look something like this. Um, now, obviously, if you zoom out, it's not going to look the same as mine, so I'm going to hit the home button. Um, but I actually have to graph this, so I need to pull a table from it. So to pull a table from this, I'm going to hit the gear icon and then the table icon. All right, so again, I'll go ahead and do that again. Okay, remember, the gear icon's right here, and you're going to press the table option. And again, you want to type, click, pick three numbers that you can plot here. Now, I am going to go ahead and pick a decimal number just so that we get used to plotting decimals. So the first point I'm going to pick is negative 1, comma, negative 3.5. Negative 1, comma, negative 3.5. My next number here is 0, comma, 3, I think. Oh, negative 3. And then we have 1, negative 2. Now, you can always plot more than 3 points, but that's just all I ask you to do. So let's go ahead and plot those points. Negative 1, negative 3.5. So negative 1 to the left, and then down 3 and a half. So right there. And then we have 0, comma, negative 3. 
and then one comma negative two. So here is our graph. Now the question is, how low is this graph gonna go? I know this is a growth, so it's gonna start off flat and then grow up. Um, so we gotta look for our asymptote. Remember, the asymptote is always a number being added or subtracted to the back of your equation. In this case, it is negative four. So your asymptote here is the equation. Remember, it is a line, so you must put y equals negative four. Now how can I check if this is correct? Why well, can we type it in the second box below? Type in y equals negative four or minus four. And you'll notice, I'm gonna go ahead and change the color, that oops, that your green line and your red line never touch each other. So that's how I know this is correct. Because if I zoom in, they never touch. So that is how I know I did that correctly. So my asymptote here is y equals negative four, that imaginary line. So I'm gonna go ahead and mark negative four on my y-axis, negative one, two, three, four. And I know that my graph is never gonna touch that number. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw an arrow and then go all the way up because I know it grows and it looks like this, something like that. All right, moving on to x-intercept. So let's go see where our x-intercept is. Well, you can just click on the x-axis where it crosses the x, uh, where it crosses, and you can get the point. So two comma zero here is our x-intercept. And then we're gonna look for the y-intercept. So you're gonna go onto your y-axis, click on the point at the y-axis, you get zero, negative three. And then next, you want to find the domain. Domain, again, is going to be all real numbers. And then your range. Remember, your range is going to be restricted here, but it always starts with a y, and it's going to be greater than whatever your asymptote number is because all of the numbers are greater than that point because nothing goes beyond that point. And here, our asymptote number is negative 4. So those numbers are always the same. Our, our last graph here, we have 4 times 2 to the power of x plus 1. If you're getting the hang of it, go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start it. So... If you want to try it, please make sure you're pausing it. So I'm going to go ahead and cross off everything I have on here. So I'll click all my x's and type in 4, parentheses, 2 to the power of x minus 1. Oh, plus 1, my bad. Plus 1. That, that matters. Make sure you type in the right number. Plus 1. All right. Now I want to graph this. I'm going to pull a table. So I'm going to hit the gear icon and press the table. And I'm going to pick three points that I can plot. So it looks like negative 2, 2, negative 1, 3, and then 0, 5. Negative 2, 2, negative 1, 0, and then 0, 5, I think is what I read. Oh, negative 1, 3, whoops. Okay, now actually, with, with, I saw I, I graphed it already, so I already know. But what's my B value here? My B value here is positive 2. My B value is greater than 1, which means here I have a growth. So remember, if B is greater than 1, you have a growth. If B is less than 1, you have a decay. Or you can just look at your graph and know that it's growing exponentially from left to right. Or decay means it's going really high and then slowly decreasing down. Okay, so this is a growth. Has it always been a growth? No, first one was decay. Okay, now let's go ahead and plot our points. So we have negative 2, positive 2, negative 1, positive 3, and then 0, comma 5. All right, now before I draw my line, I want to see what number is this number going to cross. Remember, your asymptote number is always a number being added or subtracted to the back end. In this case, it is positive 1. So the struggle is honestly making a circle that I'm satisfied with. So I'm going to go and copy that one and paste this one. All right, asymptote number here is 1. Remember, that's an equation of a line, so it's going to be y equals 1. And how can I check if I did this right? I can click on the next box below and type in y equals 1. And notice how that black line does hug the blue line, and it never touches. So if I zoom in, they never touch each other. Okay, so go ahead and mark y equals 1 on your graph. So that's going to be at, on the y-axis at positive 1. That blue line is never going to cross that yellow point. So I know that it's going to get really close down here at positive 1, but then it's going to skyrocket up. All right, moving on, we want to find the x-intercepts. Well, if I'm looking at this, I notice that my x-axis is right down here, below my asymptote. And the asymptote line is the line that it never even crosses. So is this ever going to touch the x-axis? No. So you actually have no x-intercepts here. So in this case, we have none. Then you want to find the y-intercept. So you can click on the y-axis. I'm going to get rid of that black line. I'm going to click on the y-axis and uh, the point that crosses it, which would be at 0, 5. Okay, and then we're going to look for our domain here. So our domain here is going to be all real numbers. 
and then your range is going to be y is greater than whatever your asymptote number here. So in this case, it is 1, because all of your y values are greater than that point because nothing goes beyond that point. Um, so that is it for the graphing section. Here we begin the second section of the notes where we're writing exponential equations. So there's two types of equations that we're going to use when we're writing them. Um, now your star formula chart does not give you these equations, so again, you do have to memorize these. So we've seen something like this before, y equals a times b to the x, because that was what we started with at the beginning, y times a to the power, a times b to the power of x. Now in here we see what's written with the parentheses, and here it is not. Um, but again, if you're more comfortable with the parentheses, then you can go ahead and write parentheses. You, you just typically can see it either way, so just be flexible about that. Now remember this equation can represent growth or decay. Okay, it can represent growth or decay depending on your B value. Remember your B value is your B value is your growth factor. So if your B value happens to be greater than one, then it's a growth, but if it's less than one, it's a decay. So it can represent either. So let's go ahead and define what we already know. Our A is considered our are known as our starting value or initial amount. So starting slash initial, oops, initial amount, and your B is your growth factor. But again, that growth could be a growth or it could be a decay. So it could be either or just depending on the problem. Um, now, the growth here is actually really important because um, when we're talking about word problems, the key word is going to tell us whether or not we're going to use this equation. So I'm going to leave this little arrow here for now. But remember, your growth factor is also known as your rate. But we're going to bring in some a little bit more information about that in a bit. All right, now going on to the next side, we have y equals a times 1 plus r to the power of t and y equals a times 1 minus r to the power of t. Now these equations are exactly the same, except the only major difference here is that one has a plus sign and one has a minus sign. So really, it's only one equation. It's just that that sign in the middle is different. Now, each of these represents a different thing. One represents growth and the other one represents decay. The one where you're doing one plus r is going to represent a growth equation. whereas a 1 minus r would be a decay. All right, and we'll go ahead and define. Now remember, your a value is going to be the same as what it was before, which is also known as our starting or initial amount. So if the problem says you're starting with this much money or the population of a, a school starts off with this many students or whatever that may be, that is actually going to be um, your starting amount or your initial amount, your A value. All right, moving on to your R. Now your R here is gonna represent your rate. So it's kind of like the rate on the other problem, except um, your rate here is gonna represent, be represented by something else. And we'll bring that in in just a little bit. Um, and then I'm gonna move on to what T represents. Now T represents time. And that time is going to be dependent on the, the word problem, whatever it's talking about. Days, hours, minutes, years, just depends on the time of the problem. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about the differences between these two. So in both of these problems, you're going to have a starting amount, and you're also going to have a rate. But the rate here is going to be different, and that's going to tell you which equation you're going to use. If the rate is given to you as a word, you're going to use this one on the, on the right, or on the left, I'm sorry. You're going to use a times b to the power of x. Now, what this is what I mean by a word. Your rate's given to you as a word in the problem. So example, it gives you the word like it's doubling or it's triples or it's being halved, right? So these are all words that indicate to me something is either growing or decaying, but um, it's giving to me as a word. So it's going to literally write it out for you. It's going to write out a word for you. So if the rate is a word, you're going to use this equation. If the rate is given to you as a percentage, you're going to use this one. Oops. Move that here. If your rate's given to you as a percentage, you're going to use these equations. And then depending on growth or decay, you just change the sign on in the middle. But the problem is with these is that you want to take your percentage and turn it into a decimal. So when we calculate stuff in math, we that like percentages are good for knowing things, but when we're calculating, we typically like to convert it to a decimal and calculate it that way. So you need to take your decimal convert it, or percent and convert it to a decimal. So an example of this is if I have 37% to 
to calculate the decimal for this, right, I would take it and move it two decimal places. So the decimal place behind 37 is behind the 7, that 37. If I want to calculate the decimal place, I'm going to move it over two decimal places, and that's going to be my decimal. So 0.37 would be the decimal equivalent of 37%. Another example, let's do 5%. If I have 5% and I want to convert that to a decimal, I want to move that two decimal places. Well, right now the decimal place is after the 5. If I move it over 2, it will be 1, 2, and the decimal place would go here, and there's actually a 0 here. So your decimal for this would be 0.05. Okay? So you want to change that to a decimal because we calculate things with decimals. So again, if you're rate is given to you as a word, you use the one on the left. If it's given to you as a percentage, you use the one on the right. Okay, so moving on to the next page, we're going to actually use these word problems. Um, again, you're given two types of equations, remember? You're going to use the one on the left if your rate is given to you as a word. You're going to use the one on the right if your rate is given to you as a percentage. Okay, so it's just dependent on the problem. Okay, so you purchase a car for $30,000 and it depreciates in value 2% every year. How much will it be worth in 10 years? Okay, so for each of these problems, you're going to be asked to create an equation and then answer the question. So the first part is we're going to create an equation. You purchase a car for $30,000 and depreciates in value 2% every year. Okay, so that gave us enough information to write an equation. The first question is, did they give you your rate as a percentage or a word here? Well, here they gave your uh, rate as a percentage. Your rate here is a percentage, which means you're not going to use the equation on the left-hand side. You're going to use either one of these. So the question is, which one do I use? Well, it says depreciates. It's depreciating in value 2% every year. Well, depreciate tells me that the value is going down. Depreciate means it's going down. So this tells me that this is a decay. So my rate is given to me as a percentage, and it's a decay. So I know for a fact because of the percentage, I'm going to use one of these. But because it's the decay, I'm going to use this equation. So I'm going to go ahead and write down that equation. Y equals A1 minus R to the power of T. All right, so that's our base equation. Now we're going to plug in some information that we know. We know our starting value, and we know the rate here. So we always identify A and R at the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and identify those things. Your A value here is known as your starting value. Well, the starting value of the car was $30,000. So 30000 That's your A value. Then we want to identify your R value. Remember, your R value is your rate. So our rate here is 2%. But we want to take that percentage and we want to turn that into a decimal. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make this yellow because that's our percentage. We're going to turn that to a decimal. And remember, we're going to move that over two decimal places. So 1, 2, that's going to be 0 0.02. So your rate here is 0 0.02 and your A value is 30,000. So let's go ahead and write our base equation. So we're going to have Y equals A, which is 30,000. We're going to plug in our information, 30,000 parentheses, 1 minus your R value, your R value here is 0 0.02 to the power of T. Now you're like, why don't I plug in 10 for T? Well, this is your base equation. So the first part is just make a general equation for the problem we're talking about. This is the general equation. So I could find the value of the car at any given point in time. Okay, so that's your equation. The next thing is we're actually going to solve this for what it's asking us. How much will the car be worth in 10 years? Well, years is actually time. So would I plug in 10 for T or for Y? Well, I would plug in 10 for T. So you want your time, you're going to plug in a 10. So using the equation that we came up with, you're going to plug in 10 for your T value. Y equals 30,000 times 1 minus 0 0.02 to the power of 10. Okay, and again, we're using decimals to help us out here. Now, you could type this into a calculator and simplify this, but I'm going to go ahead and use Desmos. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start practice, turn on projector mode. All right, so you're going to just type in your um, equation. Now, you don't have to type in the y equals part because, again, you're not, like, actually graphing. You're just computing here. You're just calculating. So 30,000 parentheses 1 minus 0.02 close parentheses. And remember to 
uh, bring it up the exponent. You're going to use the A to the B button here. And then you're going to type in a 10 because you're calculating for 10 years. And then you get this really long decimal, 24512.184. So go ahead and write that down. We get Y equals 24512.184. Okay, so that's what we get in our calculator. Now here we're talking about the value of a car. So we're trying to figure out the value of the car in 10 years. So if we're talking about value, we're talking about money. Well, with money, how many decimal places do you typically have when we're talking about dollars and cents? Only two decimal places. So the question is, would I keep this at 18 cents or would I round it to 19 cents? Well, because four is less than five, you're going to keep it at 18. So what does this really mean? It means that after 10 years, after 10 years, your car is now worth $24,512.18. Now again, why did the car value go down? Well, we know that the car value is depreciating, which means it's decreasing yearly at a rate of 2%. So each, each year goes on, it's decreasing in value. And that's actually true for a lot of cars, not that rate specifically, but most cars that you drive off a lot um, decrease in value right when you drive off the lot with it. So, so this is after 10 years. All right, moving on to the next one. Number two, bacteria doubles every hour. If we start with three bacteria, how much bacteria will there be after one day? Okay, so first thing you have to ask yourself is, I gotta figure out which equation to use. And the way to start, um, uh, what's it called, eliminating stuff is figuring out, is my rate given to me as a word or a percentage? So looking at this problem, it's giving, it's telling me that there's bacteria and it's doubling and we start off with three and we're trying to figure out how much we have after one day. So here is your rate given to you as a percentage or a word? Here your rate is given to you as a word and that word here is doubles. The rate is double. So the rate here is given to you as a word. Okay, I'm going to fix that yet. Okay, now the rate's giving you to as a word, which means I'm going to use the equation on the left. Now I know that for a fact there's only one of those equations, so let's go ahead and copy that base equation down. We have y equals a times b to the power of x, but again, if you don't like the multiplication sign and you want to use parentheses with your b to the power of x, that's perfectly okay too. I prefer the parentheses, so I'm gonna write it with the parentheses when I'm making my equation, but for the sake of this, I'll go ahead and just leave it like that. All right, so moving on to identifying your uh, items here. So we know that we're starting and we, are, we have our starting value and then we have our rate. So we'll start with a first. Remember, A is your starting value. What do you start with here? Well, you're starting with three bacteria. You start with three. So three bacteria. That's your A value. And then your B value here happens to be your rate. Well, your B value here is going to be two because you're doubling. If you're tripling, that would be three. If you're quadrupling, your B would be four. If your rate is halved, then you would have the number one half. So basically you're taking whatever your number or your word is and you're translating that into math. So it's saying double, so I know that's gonna be two. So let's plug in what we know. We have y equals uh, a, which is three, times b, and I'm gonna use parentheses here. Your b here is two to the power of x. Okay, so if three times two to the power of x. That's my base equation. So that's my first part of my answer is, okay, that's the equation I could use to calculate the growth of my bacteria. The second part is I gotta calculate what they want me to, to find, right? So how much bacteria will there be after one day? So I know that days is time. So do we plug in one for x because x is time? Well, you would plug it in for x because it is time, but notice how your rate says it's doubling every hour. You're doubling every hour. So we're talking about the rate every single hour. So if I want to calculate how much bacteria there'll be after one day, I got to convert that to hours. So how many hours are in one day? Well, after one day, there's going to be 24 hours. So really, this is still time, but instead of plugging in one for my x, I'm going to plug in 24 for x because x is time. So we're going to plug in 24 there. So you have y equals 3 oops, times 2 to the power of, oops, 24. 
Now you're gonna get a very large number here because again, we're talking about bacteria. And if you think about it, we're doing two times 24, two times itself 24 times. So that's gonna be a really big number. So again, I'm gonna cross uh, X out of everything. If you just hit this little X, you can cross off everything. So three parentheses, two parentheses to the power of uh, 24. And you get a large number. You're gonna get 50,331,648. We'll go ahead and copy that number down. So that's gonna be five zero three three one six four eight. Oops. I'm gonna double check that. Five zero three three one six four eight. Perfect. Now what does that mean? That means that after one day you have that much bacteria, which is a lot of bacteria. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the last one. The population of a town is currently 38,300 people. The town grows at an annual rate of 1.2%. About how many years will it take for the population to grow to 42,500 people? Now this equation or this problem is a very uh, quite different from the previous and you'll see why. Um, so I will go ahead and first of all determine whether this is a uh, which equation this would be, right? So um, here at the very top, again, you have two types of equations. You ones where you're given rate as words and one as rate as percentage. So did your problem give you your rate as a percentage or a word here? It gave it to you as a percentage. You know that you have 1.2%, okay? So if it's giving me a percentage, I know for a fact that I'm gonna be using one of these equations. But then I've gotta figure out if this is a growth or if it's a decay. Well, it says the town is growing at a rate of 1.2%. So because it says it's growing, I know that that's a growth. So I know that my rate is given to me as a percentage. And I know that I have a growth here. So if it's a percentage and it's a growth, then I know automatically my equation is going to be y equals a, parentheses 1 plus r to the power of t. Oops. All right, so now we're gonna identify our two things here. First value is your A value. Remember, A is also known as your starting value. Now, what are you starting at in this problem? Well, your town population is currently 38,300 people. So that's your starting amount, 38,300 people. And then you need to identify your B value. Well, your B value here, oh no, sorry, not B value, I'm going crazy. Your R value, your R value here is also known as your rate. So what is your rate here in this problem? Well, it says it's growing at a rate of 1.2%. But we've got to translate this to a decimal, okay? Your rate is 1.2%, but you want to write it as a decimal. So remember, you're going to move it over two decimal places. So 1, 2. So that would be 0 0.012 there. So 0 0.012. So this is what we want to use. Whoops. It's touching my arrow. That's the rate that you want to use. All right, so let's go plug in to make our um, basic equation that can fit for any problem here or for any scenario. Y equals A. A here is 38,300. Parentheses. 1 plus your R value, which is 0 0.012. Close your parentheses to the power of T. So that is your equation. And now you're gonna use that equation to solve the problem that it's asking for. Now, here it's asking for how long it will take for the population to grow to 42,500 people. Now, remember, you gotta think about this. What I plug that in for T? Remember, T represents time. Are we plugging in 42,500 years? No, it's asking us how many years will it take us for the population to grow to 42,500. So we're actually solving for the amount of years we know the population. So. For pop for people, I know that's going to be my y value. So I'm actually going to take my y value and replace it and put 42,500 people equals my equation here. And I'm actually just going to copy this because I can. You guys will have to do the long way, but it's okay. Equals that. All right, so then how do I solve this? How do I solve for t? So we're actually going to use decimals to help us. And you can actually do the same thing with your calculator. So what I'm going to do in my calculator is I'm going to type in this part of my equation in the calculator. Now I'll show you what happens when you type in the whole thing. You'll see what I mean by an error. So your calculator can't grasp something if you have two sides of an equal sign. So equals 38,300 times oops, 1 plus 0.012 
parentheses to the power of. Now remember when you're graphing in a graphing calculator at any time, the only variables you can actually type in a graphing calculator is x. So I need to take my t's and replace them with x's. So to the power of x, whoops, power of x. Now notice how I have a little hazard symbol here. Plotting single variable implicit equations is disabled. Now you're gonna see that. The reason why is you can't have two sides of an equal sign. So you gotta get rid of that first part. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all of that. And now my equation shows up as a green line and I can actually graph stuff. Okay, here's the tricky part. You need to solve for time when your y value is 42,500. You just took your y value and replaced it with that. So what's happening here is you need to create a table and you're looking for this in the y value column. So we need to follow this part really carefully because it's really easy to mess up. Now I know some of you guys have a keyboard attached to your iPad. It's better not if you don't use it here. You wanna just use the iPad keyboard. So what you have right here on Desmos, you wanna use a Desmos keyboard. All right, you're gonna pull a table from this. You're gonna hit the gear icon and hit the table. So you'll notice you're gonna get values for X from negative two to positive two. So here's how you expand that table because if you look at your Y values, they are increasing, but we need to figure out how many years it's gonna take for it to get to 42,500 people. And right now we're only at 39,200 124 people. So here's what you do. You're going to tap underneath your positive two. You're going to type in a three. So you're just continuing your table. After you've typed in the three, I'm going to hit this blue enter sign right down here and it's going to expand my table. So it's going to go up by one and I'm going to keep doing that until I see what I need to see. Now remember, you're trying to look for your population to grow to 42,500. And I'm looking for that in the Y column because I'm plugging in 42,500 in for Y. So I'm looking for that in the Y column. Well, looking at the Y column over here, remember this is your Y values. You're looking for 42,500. Well, if you're looking down and down and down, you have 41,635, 42,134, 42,640. So it looks like from year eight to year nine, you go from 42,100 people to 42,600 people. But you're looking for when it grows to 42,500 people. So the question is, what is it closest to? Well, after eight years, has it hit 42,500 people? Answer is no. After eight years, you're only at 42,134. But after nine years, you're at 42,640. So what's the answer to this? Well, you're going to have to estimate here. So this would be about nine years. Because at eight years, you're not quite there yet. And at nine years, you've definitely passed it. So I would definitely say that it's about nine years, obviously a little bit less than that, but we can't estimate too much. So we're going to say about nine years. So that's the second part of exponential equations is where we're writing the equation given some information.